But today what we're going to do is a talk on the Civil War. It's going to be two parts. Martha will start off. She'll make her presentation. We'll take a 10-minute break, and then I'll get up and I'll make another presentation. Uh, but this is all dealing with letters from the collection of the Cohasset Historical Society and letters about the Civil War. We're concentrating on letters by three individuals. Uh, Martha's going to be talking about Samuel Beale. I'll talk about a couple of the Wilcuts. The reality is Cohasset has a particularly rich supply of Civil War original Civil War letters written from the people who were involved in the engagements. And uh, <coughs> the, the group we're talking about today consists of roughly uh, 65, 70 letters. But the reality is there were letters written by other people beyond those, two, those three individuals. So, uh, the pool of letters in Cohasset might run something close to 100. Uh, some of these have more insight than others, and Martha is going to be talking about a remarkably insightful series of letters, and those are the ones by Samuel Beals. And so, Martha Horsfield, are you ready to start? Not just yet. I need my glasses just in case they're in a pocketbook somewhere else. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for turning out for this uh, program on Civil War letters. It, it always seems our interest in the Civil War never wanes. People just go on writing books about it. And I think I have been so fortunate um, these last six or eight months at the Historical Society. I've been transcribing into a Word document original letters from Civil War soldiers living in Cohasset and in neighboring towns. These letters were written to Elijah Stetson. There he is, nice kind face. <laughs> a shopkeeper whose store was located at the corner of Summer Street and Black Horse Lane. That's the interior yeah, of the store. Go. Yeah. Good. You can see um, we also have a picture of his store. It undoubtedly was a general store. It had about just everything people in Cohasset would need. And the letters themselves are preserved in a large three-ring binder, and they were gifted to the society by a Mary Archer, who is the great-great-granddaughter of Elijah. And he's often referred to in the letters as Friend Elijah or Friend Stetson. We're certainly fortunate to have this rare collection, and of course I'm even more fortunate to be involved in transcribing them, and of course the invaluable help from Bob Jackman, members of the society, and of course, local cops. We have a photo of what the letters look like. I use a magnifying glass sometimes to uh, read them. <clears throat> They're in Spencerian script, which predates Palmer Method, which some of us knew when we learned in school. <coughs> in the earliest letters to Elijah, the soldiers asked that he send food and other provisions from the store. The first letter in the collection is from Samuel F. Beals. We found with any formal document, Samuel drops the S from Beals. In this letter, dated December 21, there's no date given. From the 1st Brigade, 18th Massachusetts Regiment, he's stationed in Washington, D.C. He requests a firkin of butter, some brown sugar, half a pound of tea, stick of candy, a good cigar, and put in a good apple. <laughs> so that's a firk, and that's really large. But they came in different sizes, so that's what they would use. Since we had a good rail system in the north, Elijah could box these items up and send them off to Samuel in good order. And of course, remembering, in the beginning of the war, there was great concern about the Confederates invading Washington, so the Union had a strong presence of soldiers in and around the capital at the time. And we found, Bob found a photo of Elijah. He's in, obviously in uniform. <clears throat> because Samuel writes many letters in this collection, I decided to focus on him and experience and his experience as he describes them to friend Elijah, who is a faithful correspondent to the Cohasset soldiers. 
So many of these letters start, start off by expressing their gratitude to hear from him and to thank him in such a gracious and protracted manner as would be appropriate in the Victorian era. I only wish we had a few of Elijah's letters, but again, who knows, somebody might find a packet of them up in the eaves of an attic somewhere. And then I think we have a photo of his genealogy. Genealogy. I always get that mixed up. Is it ology or ology? Genealogy. <laughs> Whichever. <laughs> uh, he was the grandson of Stowers Beale, who was born in Cohasset, 1768, and is listed as a shoemaker. His son, Stowers Beale Jr., born in 1802, is the father of our Samuel, also a shoemaker. Bear in mind, there were numerous Beals living in town. For example, two other Samuel Beals were born the same decade and lived here. Going back to Samuel's father, Stowers, he's listed in the census as having four sons, Albacon, Samuel, James, and Isaac. <clears throat> Samuel, age 14, finishes his formal schooling and becomes a shoemaker, along with his brothers, until he enlists in the Union Army in 1862. And then we have a photo of the uh, census. According to the 1850 census, Stowers, age 45, his wife Sarah, 44, together with their family of eight children, live at house number 287. There were no street names given. Their neighbors, the Simpson family, <clears throat> live at house number 282, just a few doors away from the Beals. Their daughter, Elmira, sometimes she spells it Elmira, born in Boston, 1833, the same year as Samuel, is to be his future wife. The couple married in 1852 in Hingham at the Methodist Church. Both are 19 years old. The service is conducted by the Reverend Stephen Puffer. And we have a photo of the federal census showing the Beals. In the 1855 census, at house number 332, it shows Samuel's mother and father, Stowers and Sarah, together with their two younger children, Lydia and Isaac. Isaac is age 19, and are Samuel and wife, Elmira, plus their two little ones, Eugene, two years old, and Anne, five months, and also a Davis Beale. He's a farmer as, at age 66. He may have been an uncle, a great uncle to Samuel, but they're all living at the same address. This is a longabout way of giving you a picture of the mid-1800s and the multi-generational households that were a fact of life, a total of nine people at one address. Some years later, in one of Samuel's war letters to our shopkeeper, he implores Elijah to tell Isaac not to join the army, Isaac, of course, being his younger brother. By then, Samuel is deep in the battles, and I'm sure sees the horror of the war, as we will see in later correspondence to Elijah. The war breaks out in 1861, and our friend Samuel, age 29, enlists in 1862, Company A, 1st Massachusetts Heavy Artillery. And we have a photo of heavy artillery, what it looked like. They were horse-drawn. Of course, the horses were pulled away when they used the, uh, used the artillery. <clears throat> in one of his early letters of March 1862, he writes a lengthy letter to Elijah from Halls Hill, Virginia, Camp Barnes. He says, I am on the sacred soil of Virginia. On a clear day, from my tent door, I can see Falls Church, Washington, D.C., and Alexandria. He names his three tent mates and says, I am seated on my bed, which is made by myself out of four crutches, some small holes over which I put an old sack. Then I took my bed sack, put in my bundle of straw, put it on my prey. This with my woolen and rubber blanket is what I am seated on with my ration of candles in the shank of my bayonet, the point in the ground making a convenient candlestick. That would be what a gun or rifle looked like in the Civil War. <clears throat> Samuel describes the area as a great country for wood. White oak, yellow bark, chestnut trees grow in the forest very large, especially chestnuts. He says when we first set up camp, 
five months before, the scene looked very different from what it now does. Acres and miles of forest, which then covered the hills, are now swept off. Our regiment alone kept 150 stoves burning night and day most of the time. Noble timber trees were cut into stove wood. That's, that's what both sides had to do. They lived off the land pretty much. So they just, if there was wood available for the stoves, they would use it. <clears throat> Samuel explains he, he holds the post of Ordnance Sergeant in Company D of the 18th Mass, as well as rank of private in Company A of the 1st Massachusetts Heavy Artillery. So he's a private in Company A and a sergeant in Company D. He tells his colonel he wants to belong to both companies. The colonel assures him that if the 18th ever got in battle, that I should most likely receive the first fire, and that he gave me the first post as a mark of respect. But if I take it, as I did want, not want to leave Company D, he, the colonel, would excuse me from all camp duty and to make my choice to belong to both or not, to do as I was as I pleased. For he said, I want no man that will not volunteer. I told him, count me in. So you begin to get a sense of what this 29-year-old is like and what, that he fully understands the choices he's making and the conviction to stand by those choices. Now we have a photo of soldiers drilling. Beale tells Stetson how he can leave his baggage in camp and travel light, and that his drilling is something like work. We are drilling in the bayonet exercise. And then with a little tongue-in-cheek humor, he says, he challenges Stetson by writing, well, if you don't believe it takes muscle to go through this, just come out some evening and go with me to the big mess tent and let them put you through it, he says. Then you can see the beauty of it. He shows a little bit of humor there. This is the side of Samuel's temperament that pops out every now and then in his letters. And of course, I think if he were here today, we'd so enjoy listening to his experience of the war, both the tragedies and the humor and the pathos. Just want to make a little comment about the ball, mini ball cartridges. <laughs> they were invented in France, and they caused devastating damage when they hit the bone or the soft flesh. And usually we wonder, we, when we look at pictures of the Civil War, why were there so many amputations? The, the surgeons had really little choice. They had to amputate to save the soldier because of the devastation. So I think eventually those bullets were outlawed, but I'm not sure. I also begin to see he's an observing and dedicated soldier who understands the seriousness of war and tells Elijah, I keep 90 pounds of ball cartridges in cartridge boxes and 90 more in my knapsack. I keep things fine and ready for a moment's notice. He then gives an account of General McClellan, which lives up to pretty much what the historians say about him. He was a beloved general by his troops, but not a general willing to take the boys into battle, thereby missing opportunities to push the Confederates out of Richmond and take over the rebel capital and end the war that, that much sooner. President Lincoln is frustrated by McClellan's reticence, and he does relieve him of his command in 1863 of the Army of the Potomac. And there's a photo of him. But I love the way Samuel describes the effect McClellan has on his troops. In his letter dated June 22, 1862, he observes first that McClellan could put his command into Richmond before dark tonight, if he choose to, but he evidently counts the cost and the use of heavy guns, or just to get it his own way and his own time. So I think we can understand the President's frustration with this general. And I think we have a photo of the 1862 letter. It was a long letter. They're all long, actually. <laughs> they go pages and pages. Then Samuel writes, you want to see the general when he comes among the boys and see the caps fly through the air like a flock of blackbirds. To me, this is poetry. <laughs> he just uses beautiful imagery. And our boys cheer like fun. I did not think of cheering myself, but was intent on watching as he approached towards the end of camp. 
He got so near, I could see his features. I saw they wore a smile of satisfaction, and yet I could not catch the expression of his eye, but in his easy, caring way, at that moment, seemed to be the personification of a boy exulting in boyish satisfaction of pride. But in a moment, he was nearer. And I tell you, friend Stetson, in his eye flashed a soul. I was never before so electrified. I was glad as I was filled with joy, and my eyes filled with tears of gratitude for the gift of a smile I saw in him. And with his eyes resting an instant on mine, then he turned his horse, and I saw the glistening of satisfaction in his eye as he stood in his saddle and gave a hearty cheer himself for his command. It was a cheer with a will, and he swung his cap, and as the horse turned on his horse with a smile, he beckoned to the crowd as he left in the direction of Richmond. Here Samuel indicates McClellan's gesture is a hint to the soldiers that he meant to take them to Richmond. Samuel ends his letter, dated June 22, from Camp Gaines Mills, Virginia, by asking to be excused for his bad spelling. Remember Samuel was only 14 when he finished his formal education. However, this whole collection of letters is remarkable from the standpoint of their style, their spelling, and their content. <clears throat> he tells Elijah, letters from our friends at home make a hard time pleasant and keep the right side up with the blues and keep, and keep us feeling well. He closes with, give my best wishes to your wife and son Albert, your friend, S.F. Beals. Then we have a photo of that letter <clears throat> from Camp Keynes. In Samuel's letter, February, updated February 12 or 17, I couldn't read which it was, 1863, written near Camp Fredericksburg, Virginia, he tells Elijah, he, he thanks Elijah for sending him postage and says, postage stamps, and says, I am now in funds having been paid off and I request you to discontinue for present sending postage stamps in your letters to me. But he continues by saying, I will have the chief to tell you whenever I cannot get them to you. Then Samuel offers his opinion of General Burnside. And very briefly, Burns Ambrose Burnside was appointed by President Lincoln to replace McClellan as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Burnside reluctantly accepts the appointment and orders a bold advance to Richmond. He experiences heavy delays crossing the Rappahannock River. Bob, are you going to chat a little bit about that river? Well, I can say just a word or two. Um, basically, what you have is a situation where in war, not all land is of equivalent value. There's certain land that is very strategic and other land with no strategic value. And you know, the war was taking place all across the nation, but in the, on the Atlantic coast, you had a concentration. You had Washington up here and Richmond down there, and there was the old European concept, if you could win the other guy's capital, you win the war. And so, you know, the Union wanted to march on Richmond, the Confederacy wanted to, to march on Washington. And <clears throat> the problem that you had with, with these rivers, okay, so you've got the Chesapeake Bay out here, the Potomac River here, and then down below that is the Rapid Hook River, which runs, Rappahannock River that runs this way. Now, the problem is the span that you have here is so great that it wasn't feasible to put a bridge across. So this land out here was, was not of great value from a military point of view, from a naval but not army point of view. Um, what the Confederacy wanted to do was come up and travel to the west of the Potomac River and then come into Washington from the west. And basically, you had to get above the uh, wide area of the Potomac to do that. But to, to get to the Potomac, you had the Rapid Hornet, and that's in this area. 
Here it's too wide. As you get up into Fredericksboro and uh, some of these other areas that you hear so much about the battles taking place, the battles were concentrated in this area because you had to get across this river and each side would try to hold that river as their defense and prevent the other side from getting below it. So this was the concentrated area right along here where you had a lot going on. And, and that's where Samuel ends up spending a lot of his time uh, you know, when, when he was uh, engaged in this. Well, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> this delay allows General Lee to assemble his army of Northern Virginia for the ensuing Battle of Fredericksburg. Unfortunately, Burnside does not do well in Richmond and in Fredericksburg, with heavy casualties in both battles. Heavy rains hampered his already demoralized army and his march to Fredericksburg was later known as the Mud March. Shortly after, General Burnside resigns and is replaced by General Hooker. There is some uh, discrepancy whether he in fact resigns or in fact uh, Abraham Lincoln relieves, relieves him of his uh, command. Anyway, um, General Joseph Hooker takes, takes over. And in the, refer the reference to the Mud March is significant in Samuel's letter of February 12th where we find him near Camp Fredericksburg. <coughs> he says of Burnside, he deserves the honor due a man who has done the best he could. And if one is disposed to honor him less for what he did not do, let them first see what he had to do. Samuel is respectful and sympathetic to Burnside because he saw the challenges and frustrations Burnside faced, even concerns that his, some of his officers may have been insubordinate. We have another photo of Burnside. Beals continues by describing his impression of the general. At Fredericksburg, General Burnside stood for some minutes close to me, and I got a good close look, square look right in his eyes where he was not over six foot off. And I saw him as a man working with a heavy load on his mind. <coughs> Yet firmness and kindness too were seen by me in his heart through the large full windows of his soul. Samuel also mentions General Hooker by saying, General Hooker, I have often seen, and you may bet your life, it won't do to play Bo Peep with him. The next is a hand-drawn map. This again appears in that same letter, February 12. You know, oftentimes the soldiers would draw these little maps, usually in pencil, on their letters to explain uh, to Elijah how the battles were and what was taking place and what the terrain looked like. <clears throat> he writes about wounded soldiers by referring to his hand-drawn map. This is where Thomas got hit. He spoke as cool and says, Goodbye, old Company D. God bless you and your good duty. And then he explained it. Then Samuel notes, between the river, we pulled quite a number of dead soldiers lying in the street and by the side of the road. As I passed along, I saw a number of dead secesh. Secesh is an abbreviation for secessionists. Enough to convince me my work, the work done in clearing the city of armed traitors the day before was boys' play. Then we have a photo of some of the casualties. Matthew Brady, the famous photographer, took thousands of pictures during the Civil War, and many of those pictures were sent off to the north for the civilians to see what the war was like. <clears throat> Making additional references to a sketch map of Fredericksburg, he says, this is about the place where I found a comrade in the night, about 2 a.m. I was looking for some of our wounded boys I figured might be among the hundred who lay in the mud having crawled as far as they could towards us. <clears throat> and there in the cold, damp night, with mud ankle deep by waiting, some to die, some for a friend, someone to help. And again, this refers to Burnside's mud march. It was sad work for all of us as I groped around calling 18th Massachusetts Company. Some were begging for help. It made us almost cry to pass on, <clears throat> yet I was on duty with Company D. Samuel explains he felt he needed to help his boys 
and he began to search for the wounded from his own company. Again, this is a sample of that letter. <coughs> he describes his attempt to rescue a comrade, a morale Perkins. By and by, I got a friend to answer my call, and I went in the direction of the sound and soon found Perkins. Oh, Sergeant, he said, how glad I am that you have found me. I am with you, said I, till I can get you out of this, and I must move you. Yes, he said, but it will kill me to be moved. My leg is broke, and I have a ball through my side, but I can't die here. I will do as well as I can. And then you'll have hard work to carry me, he added. Samuel tells Elijah, he had lain in this spot for eight hours. A man who was not quite as bad as he had crawled up to him, and then with his band blanket had covered him, but he was very cold. Samuel was able to wrap Perkins in the blanket and carry him to the ambulance, but he suffered just terribly by the ride, but bore it like a hero. Um, it's known fact that sometimes the soldiers were more additional wounds were, were in, inflicted on them as they rode in the ambulance. They were terrible. The roads were rough and there was no suspension and it was just a brutal ride for them. Samuel continues to tell Elijah that the wounded man was taken to the city and his leg was cut off. He is now all over his suffering and we surely miss a good soldier and a brave boy. <clears throat> now I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the Battle of Bull Run, 2nd Manassas. On a more cheerful note, in another letter, Samuel tells Elijah about how the 2nd Maine Regiment fought like tigers and well they did repay their enemy at the Battle of Bull Run. He describes how our Maine comrades were hotly set on and how they expressed a desire to see their friends of the Massachusetts 18th Regiment. So they sent a horseman to meet us. In the haste to greet them, we skedaddled a company of secesh cavalry in the woods and caused the enemy to abandon another attack on the positions the Maine boys held. And we got up to grasp the hand of our able Maine boys, but not in time to help them, only as our presence caused the enemy to abandon another attack on the position the Maine boys held. I did a little research, and it appears that um, the Massachusetts 18th and the 2nd Maine did serve in some battles together, so I think there's a relationship there, camaraderie. <clears throat> oh yes, um, of course nicknames always develop during war, but the Union uh, soldiers referred to uh, the, the uh, Confederates as Secesh, Gray Bucks, or Johnny Reb. And, and the Confederates referred to Billy Yank. I don't know, I'm sure they had other nicknames. <laughs> I'm not privy to them, so I don't know. <laughs> you can bet, though, they did. <clears throat> Samuel tells Elijah their regiment is used up, that's the second name, at the Battle of Bull Run, leaving only about 300 in the regiment. The regiment is about 1,000 men, maybe a little less. But the Maine boys cheered when we came up, and well they might, for they had fought double their number two, and also for about four hours. <clears throat> Now we have a photo of uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. I'm going to take a little sidebar here to explain this. Because the 2nd Maine had lost so many men, and this was common when a regiment was, was reduced to just a few, um, they joined up with the famous 20th Maine, commanded by Joshua Chamberlain. And they went off to fight at Gettysburg, succeed in winning the Battle of Little Round Top. The significance of this is, if Chamberlain had failed to hold that position, the Union would have lost Gettysburg. Instead, it turned the tide of the war. And then I think um, you can see, I bet anyone been to Gettysburg, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's a strategic, it's just a bumpy, rocky hill, but it was strategic for Chamberlain, and they fought hand-to-hand -hand battle. It was, it was a gruesome battle, but he prevailed. So then in October 1864, <coughs> we find Samuel in the hospital at Camp City Point. This was a, a um, tent hospital. He tells Elijah he's not wounded. He's had a malarial fever with severe inflammation of the stomach and dysentery. He asks Elijah to send him the Cohasset doctor's post office address. I will write him a description of the hospital with certain facts relating to it. 
and perhaps tell him what I think of some of the doctors in the army. He's <laughs> we don't need to say anymore. He's making reference here to what he describes as the army doctor making wrong diagnosis of his ailments. Now I'm jumping ahead because this talk is long, but the last letter in our collection from Samuel to Elijah is when he's heading back to Boston on a steamer and is mustered out of the service October 20, 1865. So he serves in the army for three years. We see him upbeat and optimistic in the beginning, and then he reports on the battles, the casualties, the loss of comrades, hospitalization, and finally a return to civilian life and his family. Samuel does not return to the shoemaker trade. In the 1870 census report, Samuel, then age 37, is a teamster in Boston, Ward 12. <clears throat> we assume he may have learned his trade in the Army ha handling the heavy artillery. In the 1870 census, that's in the 1870, and then in the 1880 census, he and his family are living in South Boston, and he's listed as a truck man. By the time of Samuel's death at age 54, he is a resident in Weymouth, apparently dies uh, at, during a short stay here in Cohasset, October 22, 1887. The cause of death is listed as exhaustion. Our friend Elijah Stetson dies in 1908. In summary, these letters are graphic and give such detail that we can really begin to understand what American soldiers, both Union and Confederate, endured fighting for their beliefs, each side believing that God was on their own side. We have a photo of President Lincoln. <clears throat> In his second inaugural address, and I quote from McPherson's book, The War That Forged Mason, the Nation, McPherson notes, President Lincoln was one of the few principles in the war of transcending the prevailing rhetoric of absolute right or absolute wrong. Lincoln notes that each side invokes God's aid against the other. Both could not be right. In fact, neither was right. Lincoln says, for the Almighty has his own purposes. And now I'll end up with another excerpt, excerpt from Lincoln's second inaugural address, more familiar to us. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. So thank you all very much for allowing me to introduce you to Samuel Beals. from these handwritten letters. And, you know, I g gave us some help, a few other people gave us some help, but 90% of the work in transcribing those letters was done by Martha. And uh, it's, a, it's a lot of painstaking, very slow work in order to get through all of that and, and to figure it all out. So, uh, in, in my case, what had happened is Ten years ago, the Cohasset Historical Society was putting on a summer exhibit which was going to feature the Civil War. And as part of that, they got the staff together and uh, basically broke up the task of trying to figure out what each one of these letters said. And so, uh, when I came along, these letters had already been transcribed, and so I'm working straight off of the transcriptions, and that makes it a lot easier. I think there are probably more letters by Lyman Wolcott and also more letters by Elbridge Wolcott, but they weren't all transcribed. But I'm working from the ones that were transcribed by the Historical Society. And as I've indicated, there were probably a hundred, there probably are in the collection of the Cohasset Historical Society, 
about 100 letters. We're talking about 60 of those letters here today. Uh, so it's a pretty deep collection of Civil War letters. The ones Martha dealt with had tremendous insight into the strategy and the experience of, of the Civil War battlefront. Um, most people writing, most soldiers writing home letters did not have that same skill. And, you know, the Wilcut letters do not have as much insight as, as uh, Samuel Beale's letters. So, I say that right off the bat. Now, from my point of view, the most important aspect of the Wilcut letters is the information that they provide regarding uh, the way that the Army Corps of Engineers operated uh, during the Civil War. And we'll set a little bit of a foundation for where we're eventually going here. The, the very first engineer in the American Army was George Washington. So he gets appointed general, he comes up here, looks around and says, you know, these, these fortifications have to be built a whole lot better than this. And so he, you know, becomes the first, gen first engineer, and then he appoints other people with engineering and construction background into the artificers. And the artificer corps eventually in, 19, in 1802, that becomes the Army Corps of Engineers. So that's where the Army Corps of Engineers begins. Uh, it wasn't called the Army Corps of Engineers in, in, during the Revolutionary War. Now, basically what happens is uh, Winfield Scott was a famous general but of elderly years and he was asked, what should we do in order to defeat this developing confederacy? And he said, well, it sh we should form like a snake and just strangle them. You know, uh, if, we, if we create an embargo, they can't get anything in, and then we'll just let them collapse from the inside. And we, we can cut divisions off, cut it up into parts as, it, as they fall. Uh, the critics were... Uh, thought this was ridiculous. It was much too involved. They said, just go down and take over Richmond. Actually, this is actually the strategy that ends up winning the war, was the idea of embargoing everything. Uh, as far as the states that succeeded, before Lincoln became president, these dark red states were already uh, part of the Confederacy. The red the bright red states are the states that joined the Confederacy after Lincoln took over the presidency. <coughs> Yellow states are Confederate states, excuse me, are slavery states that did not join the Confederacy. So you're talking Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. And the Southern strategy, a big part of the Southern strategy for the first two years of the war was, what we're going to do is get these other states to join in with us. And Lee makes a big march up in 1862 through Maryland and Delaware. He's expecting to be greeted with all sorts of jubilation and people going, yay, yay and wanting to join the Confederacy. What happens instead is they give them a very loop, lukewarm reception. Uh, they don't shoot at them, but they don't join them, they don't celebrate them. And so two years into the war, Lee realizes his basic strategy has failed. Um, now, as far as the, the theaters, there were basically four theaters. This Pacific theater out here is really quite minor. But there were four different theaters where the war was being fought. Most of what we're talking about today is going to be up in this area here. Just as Samuel Beals was concentrated in this area, this is also where Elbridge uh, Wilcott was concentrated. Lyman Wilcott served two different enlistments. The first one was up here. The second one was down 
uh, on the Gulf Coast, basically New Orleans and, and the area uh, up to Mobile. So basically, we're looking at that eastern theater uh, as far as our area of concentration. The reality is some of the most successful aspects of the war were not fought in that eastern theater, which was sort of a standoff, but what happens is the Mississippi River becomes so vital because by taking over the Mississippi River, it was possible to cut uh, Louisiana and Texas off and Arkansas off from the rest of the Confederacy. So what you're doing is you've, you've got the Confederacy enclosed and now you start breaking off sections. And <clears throat> when you separate those sections, then uh, the rest of the effort, it becomes a lot more futile. Okay? Now, uh, Samuel Beale's letters had incredible insight. Also, moderation. You know, the way that he, he gives credit to these various generals and talks about the problems they were confronting, that there was a lot of moderation in there. Uh, Elbridge and Lyman Wilcott uh, basically wrote more common type of, of letters. As far as where they lived, they lived at 63 Summer Street, and they did not, as far as we know, send any letters to Elijah Stetson. But if you're familiar with St. Anthony's Church, that's where Eliza's store used to be. And you just go down Summer Street to 63 Summer Street. There were four houses between them at that time. So actually, the Wilcott brothers were almost next door neighbors of Elijah Stetson and, and his store. Um, but they were writing to family members, particularly the oldest sister, Mary. Uh, Mary was a uh, seamstress. She never did marry. And she seems to be uh, receiving letters from all of the brothers. We're only quoting letters from two of the brothers here. Okay, so Elbridge letters, I think, are more interesting because they go into the Army Corps of Engineer. And, and this is a group that's usually ignored by uh, most of the writers about the Civil War. And uh, he also his letters are of interest because they tell us about three other Cohasset guys that were in the unit with them. And uh, here's a breakdown of, of the family. Warren Wilcott was the oldest, but was the father, and his, his wife was Mary. Their first daughter was Mary, and then you had Joseph, Hiram, Louisa, Elbridge, Adius, Lyman. Okay, so that's the sequence. Edo, uh, I, it took a while before I fig figured it out. I was looking for comments about Addy and I was never finding them. Turns out his nickname was Edo. Okay, so that, that's where you find him showing up in the letters. Uh, the family, um, I say here Jesse Wilcox, actually there's a, there's a Philip Wilcox Wilcott before him. And the funny thing is, it's, he spelled the Wilcott with one L and one T. And eventually the family's gone back to that spelling 400 years later. So it's uh, interesting the way the family spells. This is the house at 63 uh, Summer Street. Obviously, it's still there. Um, that's where the family was raised. Quite a large house. The grandfather in this case was Joel Wilcott. Uh, Joel Wilcott is very important for a uh, diary that he maintained for just about his entire adult life. But he was the most successful builder in Cohasset in, his, in the revolutionary and federal period. And he built this house for his son Warren. And the house stayed in the family. It doesn't look that way because you see it's owned by the Stoddards, but the Stoddards actually married into uh, the Wilcott family. So it stayed in the family actually for a couple of hundred years. Okay, um, now what happens is an uh, article was published in the Hingham Journal in September 4th of 
16, uh, excuse me, 1863. And it mentions these four soldiers from Cohasset that have joined the Army Corps of Engineers. And so it says, a noble band of her heroes, Mr. Zenius Zodin, Charles Henry Pratt, son of Captain Levi Pratt, and two cousins, Elbridge Wilcott and Andrew W. Williams. This noble band of heroes belonged to the United States Army and are stationed in the Corps of Zappers and Miners. <laughs> that sounds pretty sassy. Uh, Sappers and Miners, that's actually an old British nickname that they gave to the Corps of a Active uh, Artificers, okay? And so the Corps of Artificers become the Corps of Engineers. So these guys are in the Corps of Engineers, but they're still using this old nickname, which is Zappers and Miners. <coughs> and uh, it says here they haven't been uh, heralded as much as other regiments, but they're very well deserving of notice. Uh, it talks about how dangerous and important it is. And, and it turns out that General McCullen becomes actually involved. He, w he was a micromanager, and so he actually is sending letters to the people in this corps and saying, you can't buy this, you have to buy that. So he's telling them what types of pontoons to buy for their <laughs> pontoon uh, bridges and things of this sort. Uh, General McCullen said, a brave and gallant set of fellows, the service they render to their country, laying pontoon bridges at the battles of Fredericksburg and their country constantly indebted to them, and our brave boys of Cohasset will always be foremost and never shrink when there is work. Okay? And then it goes on and talks about uh, Charles Pratt. He says he's not 21 years old yet, but he's an accomplished young man, understands his business, and went home last summer, sick. He could not remain long to recover fairly. So anxious was he to serve his country and to be on duty. So he apparently went back a, a bit premature. And then as far as Stoddard is concerned, he gets uh, recognized for his work. Stoddard has, was, has so gallantly conducted himself, he's been promoted to or orderly sergeant um, in reports to the War Department for good and daring conduct. His superior officer has said a good deal about his devoted and patriotic young man. And then you have Andrew Williams, and he's an artificer, art, art uh, and this branch, a heroic fellow who's quite competent, so that he drew the attention of General Hooker personally. And if the Corps had been larger, would have long ago been promoted. He is always on duty, ready to serve, where there is work. He is very popular in the Army and is called Good Pluck. <laughs> and then there's Mr. Wilcott. And he acts as a Mason. Well, he was a Mason, but he did many, many other things, actually, uh, as you'll see eventually. Uh, in this capacity, most useful and very popular and always sings. We won't go home till morning and we won't go home till it is done. And he keeps the company cheerful and in good spirits. So you get the idea that, uh, you know, Elbridge Wilcott is basically sort of an upbeat, cheerful type of guy, uh, the kind of guy you sort of like to have around on your team. And then, then it concludes, uh, in all, they are a brave set. They pick for themselves the best girls in town on their return. <laughs> God bless them and bring them safely back to the New England firesides. Okay? So that's what the Hingham Journal had to say about this uh, foursome from Cohasset. Um, we're going to first take a look at, at Elbridge's letters. And I've broken Elbridge's letters 
uh, of passages from the letters into two different groups. The first looking at sort of the routine request. In other words, when Martha read her letters, she read some about descriptions of the battle, but she also wrote about the requests that the soldier, that Samuel Beals was making, and, and we've read other letters, uh, you know, where other soldiers have made similar requests for Stetson to send them things. Now, in contrast, what you see with the Elbridge family is these five brothers are all writing to their older sister, and they're having her ship them shirts, stockings, cigars, you know, all of the things that they need. So I, I put that type of a letter into the first category here. That box you speak of, if the boys have got a blue or woolen shirt and they don't want, why chuck it? And a pair of suspenders, and if you've got plenty of butter and it don't cost 60 cents a pound, as that is the price put here by some in, and some cheese, anything else that you have mind to. And so basically, you know, he's looking for shirts, cheese, uh, a whole variety of things. And because of the trains that we had at the union level, the trains all operating on the same gauge, it was possible to get these packages from Cohasset to the front lines in about a week or, or maybe eight or nine days. And you see this in the, in the letters that go back and forth. You can tell how how long it took for that particular letter to get there, okay? Mm -hmm. And then he writes of this other one. And this is, he's writing this to his brother Wallace. And it's interesting with Wallace, when he's born, Wallace's name is spelled W-A-L-L-I-S. And that continues until <coughs> Wallace gets to be about 18 years old and he discovers his family <laughs> didn't know how to spell his name. <laughs> and so, from 18 years old on, his name is Wallace, spelled W-A-L-L-A-C-E, okay? Uh, but he writes to Wallace, I received the box last Tuesday and found everything fresh and in good order. It had been opened, but nothing was taken out. As all the express boxes come to the Army are uh, overhauled in search of liquor. Okay, so liquor was the contraband of the day, and uh, you know basically every package was going to be checked for liquor as it was coming in. Okay, and then he, he writes this letter to his, his sister Mary. Uh, I received two letters from Lyme. Lyme being, you know, and he spells Lyme sometimes with a Y and sometimes with an I. But Lyme being the nickname for his brother, Lyman. Okay, so you don't say Lyman, you just say, hey, Lyme. So received two letters from Lyme since he's been at, at Fort J. He likes first rate. We got paid the day before yesterday, and I will enclose $20, and $20 more I will direct to father. So if it gets lost, there will be a chance love left. Give my love to all. And so this is one of the issues. You had businesses that were involved in transporting parcels. You had the mail service. And it operated pretty much effectively. But then payday came. And payday means the soldier who some, they're supposed to be paid once a month, but as some of these letters will show you, it was sometimes six months before paydays. So when payday arrived, all of a sudden the soldiers were flush with money, and there was a tendency to either mail some of that money home or send packages containing a, a bill secreted inside of something, you know? And so the people operating these express services understood that. And it's usually right after the express, right after payroll, some express guy will get a bunch of packages and then just disappear. 
And what he's doing is basically stealing the money that the soldiers are trying to send home to their families. Uh, and so that's why you see the money being split up. I'm sending 20 bucks this way and 20 bucks that way. Hopefully we'll all get there, but let's hope that at least one of them arrives. Now, we talked about the Rappahannock River earlier. At one point, he has to flee across the Rappahannock River. And there's this massive retreat. During the retreat, they're trying to go as fast as they can. One way of going faster is to dump some of the stuff you carry. So he, along with a lot of other soldiers, dump this, their knapsacks and other things that they're carrying so that they can move more rapidly. And so he says this, I lost my knapsack crossing the Rapidan with everything in it, as well as many others. So you see, we can't write just when we wish. In other words, he doesn't even have anything to write with or stamps to send. But that must not mock a, a difference with any of you writing. So I can't write you, but you write me. I don't know, as you can read this, but it is the best I can do at present. Give my love to all. So that's his, his concern in that one. Now, apparently the relatives write back and say, how can you be surviving if you don't have your clothes and your blankets and all of these things. So here's his response in the, in the next letter. You wonder how I could get along without clothes. As then, the old saying is, where there is a will, there is a way. Well, all of the clothes I carry now, I wear. After I lost my clothing, I picked up a pair of socks washed them, and wore them until I came across a better pair, and so on. And of course, where is he finding extra pairs of socks? Well, off of corpses, basically, you know? So he's, he's taking a pair of socks and getting that, and wears them until he can get another pair. The way I managed my shirt when I got a chance, I would wash it, wringing it out, putting it on, and then let it dry on my back, necessarily, ne of necessity. Necessity is the mother of invention, you know, and a soldier will find some means to get along. So this is the way that he's living with, without his knapsack. Then in another letter he writes, you may send me a toothbrush when you get time, and if Lyme has not enlist enlisted you tell him to keep clear of the army as long as he can. The Cohasset boys are all well, love you all. Okay? So basically what's happened is Lyman has completed his first enlistment. He's contemplating going in for a second enlistment. And Elbridge is telling him, no, no second enlistment. You know, don't mess with that. Um, You know what, I, I have some other stuff on this, don't, don't enlist, um, but it's Lyme, Lyme, I have Lyman's response to all of this. So he tells Mary to tell Lyman not to re-enlist. She tells Lyman not to re-enlist, and then Lyman writes back to her saying, I'm not worried about that, you know. So we'll, we'll see that in a moment. So Elbridge's letters, uh, now these are the ones dealing with the Army Corps. So what kind of stuff? Well, it turns out any construction that needed to be done was done by the Army Corps of Engineers. Could they do it all? They didn't have enough people. And so basically, the Army Corps of Engineers, when they could, they did all the work themselves. But when they couldn't have enough hands, they supervised the work, and they got people from the regular army or people from the militia to give them enough hands in order to complete the work. 
So any construction that went on, it was the Army Corps of Engineers. Some of this was permanent construction, but some of it was temporary, putting up a bridge that you may only have in place for four or five hours and take, then taking the bridge back down. Okay, so uh, he wrote, I received your letter last night and will try to answer it. Looks like he's making the effort right now. Uh, it is a very busy time for us at present and the whole battalion has been at work most of the time for about three weeks building winter quarters, stables, etc. We got out our houses finished, we got our houses finished and the stable and we're now working to put up one for each officer. Our huts are all one size, 10 feet by 6 feet, four men in a hut, and we've got a fireplace and keep pretty comfortable. We have had some very cold weather and several snowstorms. You might remember in one of the courses last winter, we talked about Tom, Thomas, Thompson Island and the orphanage that used to be out there. And we talked about that orphanage having huts with 10 feet by 6 feet, four boys in a hut with a fireplace. So where did that all come from? You see, it, it goes back to the Civil War. It basically, you know, these, those were built 30 years after the Civil War, but they're using the same construction that was used during the Civil War. Okay, this is another letter, clearly. Um, the weather is fine, but plenty of mud. We have a detail of men out in front of the building at the earthwork, and the rest of us are putting up a building 20 by 50 feet for the benefit of the battalion. Sundays, it will be used as a church, and the rest of the week, for theatrical purposes. So, Bob, you see, they did have theater in the Civil War. For theatrical purposes. It was, it was got up by members of the battalion. We have already set for a lot of plays and musical instruments and expect to have it finished by Saturday next. We had a divine service on the Sabbath in the open air for the first time since I've been in the field. Next Sunday, I suppose we will have meeting in our new building. So, you know, eventually, as they build out the winter quarters, they start off with the smaller houses, and then they end up building offices, quarters, and then this church and meeting, meeting place. Now, re-enlistment, it turns out that the Army Corps of Engineers, it was, a tough, it was a tough duty to take because you enlisted for five years and not many people wanted to do that. And so, he's, you know, the, the, within the regiment, they're clearly concerned that they're not getting enough re-enlistments. And he writes this to, actually, his brother Wallace. <coughs> re-enlistments are not going... Uh, on a very brisk at this in this corps, the period of enlistment is for five years, and we have a recruiting office in Boston, New York, Philadelphia. They've got a few recruits as yet, but I don't think they will get a great lot to serve the, that term. Now, in addition to that, they're competing against the bounties that are being offered by the various towns and states to sign up for much shorter service. We had an order read to us since I commenced this stating <clears throat> that anyone with less than a year to serve could re-enlist for three years. A bounty is $1,000 from New York and 35 days of furlough. Okay, so they're trying to really make an inducement here for people to re-enlist. Now, what happens is his, his core had four uh, companies, A, B, C, and D. Companies A and C had gone to the Rapidan to throw down a bridge, 
they went away Saturday and are expected back today. They did not lay the bridge owing to low water. So it turns out when they got there, the water was so low you could ford it, so you didn't need a bridge anyway. So they came back. The infantry forded the river, drove the Rebs back a mile, and returned, finding them in heavy force. That's about all the news. So you can see how they're trying to keep each other restricted to the opposite side of that river. Okay, then he goes on, and he realizes he hasn't written to his sister for a while. There's been a lot of fighting, and he, he understands that his sister is probably quite apprehensive. And so he writes, I suppose you are all worrying about the soldiers at the present time, and no doubt have a good reason for myself. I am all right, yet as well as the other boys. Fred Bennett, I saw the fifth day after the fight. We had a pretty hard time. For about eight days after crossing the Rapidan, marching and working all day and part of the night. So these guys, it's not like they were putting in eight hour days. They weren't even putting in 12 hour days. They were working all day and also part of the night. But I don't grumble a mite. It is nothing compared to the infantry. So the infantry are in the front lines. These guys in the Army Corps of Engineers usually are not in the front lines. They sometimes end up there, but the plan is not for them to be there. Actually, this group was combined with uh, a group out of Newburyport at Anatinum, and one of the officers from the Newburyport group was shot and wounded, and he was one of my relatives. Okay, so uh, sometimes the guys in, in the Army Corps of Engineers did get did get wounded or shot. Um, we have only one officer with us now. The others are away on different staff. We keep at headquarters. Yet probably will. It is no use for me telling you anything about the fright for you hear so more, much more of it than I, I do. But there is, no one, there is one thing certain, they have, not so, they have not had such hard fighting before they fight pretty much every day. We move camp every day with headquarters. So it's clearly going through a really, really rough shot during this period right here. Our company has been with the 18th Army Corps for about a, a week to work on rifle pits and batteries. So basically, when they, when they set up a battery with these cannons that are set in place, who, who creates that space where the cannons are protected and yet they, they have a, a view of the battlefield? It's the Army Corps of Engineers. So they have to go out and work with the artillery guys to set this up. Captain Farquhar is the engineer officer and a fine man he, hit, he is. We are now back at headquarters near Cold Harbor. It is getting to be pretty warm as the Army seems to be laying still at present. And I think they are entitled to it if anyone be there is no knowing how long we will stay here for Grant is big on a flank movement. And so what's happening here, this is, you know, this is 64, and so in the summer of 64, he can see as the troops are being deployed to different areas, you can predict what Grant is up to, he's going to make a flank movement. And clearly uh, that, that is what happened. This is only a week later, and now this is what he writes. I received your letter this morning. We moved into the camp yesterday, laid camp all day, and I don't think there will be anything for us to do today. When we were up at Sports, Sports, Bit, Sports Savannah, Savannah, we were attacked by the we were attached to the 18th Corps for about a week by General Smith. They came from Butler's department with the other companies. We were distributed with the other corps. We are all together again. So this, this is before 
the deployment by Grant, and then, bingo, a week later, he reports that all these guys have come back together. This is after the deployment by Grant. We made a flank movement, and from there to the James River, got there the 14th and put a bridge across. We're going to see the bridge he built in just a minute. We put a bridge across the James River with the 50th New York and moved the next day with headquarters where we are now. General Wistrel was on the bridge while we were at work, and he was one of our first lieutenants at Washington. He recognized the boys right off. He was in Butler's command. So this is a big thing. You saw that when Martha was reading her letters. Remember? Uh, May 2nd. The, the, the main 2nd Regiment and the, uh, the uh, Massachusetts AT. They knew one another because they served together in a couple of battles. That's but why all, that camaraderie. But also Samuel talks about looking Burnside in the yes, eye yes. and later looking H Hooker in the yeah, eye. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That meant a lot. When you could look at your general that was leading you, look him in the eye, you could read his mind, you could see he was ready for battle. And that's what's happening here. You've got this General Wistrel coming across. He recognized, hey, these are the guys that we were work with at Anatinum. And so, hey, I know you guys. Bingo. That just lifts their spirit wonderfully. Okay, so this is actually the bridge that they built. This is the bridge across the James River. This is a very important move. I'm also using it as a way of saying how a pontoon bridge works. So basically, you've got a distance here. This might be 200, 300 feet across, and too deep to ford. And so how do you get across? Well, you need a bridge. How do you build the bridge? Well. Each one of these is a pontoon. A pontoon is basically like a canoe, except it's much sturdier than a canoe. And you've got a whole series of these. As you're putting the pontoons out, then you connect them up with boards over the top. After you've got all of the pontoons in place and all of the framework in place, then you put a decking called a chest over the entire top. Okay? So that's the way that they would go about building this bridge from one side of the Rappahannock River to the other side, or in this case, the James River, which is uh, an associated waterway. Okay? So that's basically the, the process and, and that's what this crew was doing. These four kids from Cohasset were part of that crew. And here you can see, in this case, we're looking at a pontoon bridge which is built out of wood. We've got people standing on, sitting on that side. So I'm going to stand on this side so I'm not blocking. Do you see how these are wooden constructed pontoons? So. They would build a pontoon and move it, you know, put it on wagons, transport it by wagons, or transport a series of these. You could sit some of these, they, they would actually ride upside down. But you know how you can take boats, dories, and stack them one inside another? You could do the same thing with these pontoons. So you'd stack four or five of these pontoons upside down, put them on a wagon, and transport them in that fashion. Now this is another way of constructing a pontoon. You see how it's got a wooden frame on the inside, but over the outside, this is a heavy canvas cover. And so this canvas is, is sufficiently water resistant so that you can put this bridge in, use it for a couple of days, and then take the bridge up. Um, so this is a more, more temporary, the problem being that the pontoon bridge with the canvas base is going to eventually have water seeping into it, whereas these wooden ones, the water doesn't seep in nearly to the same extent. Uh, these could be left in place for weeks. 
One of the things they did, they would change the position of the bridge. So you guys go across, you take the bridge up, you go down, you know, like half a mile, and you put the bridge back. And that way, when you retreated, the enemy's thinking you're going over the same bridge, so they're, they're lining up that way. You're actually going to a different spot, and so you can escape them on your retreat. So there was all kinds of uh, machinations going on, and the Army Corps of Engineers was basically the outfit that was making this all possible. Okay? Now we're on to another letter to uh, Mary. We are having pretty busy times now putting up works at the front building, magazines, and we have de details all night and day. We are at work in front, on the front line, which is very close to the enemy. So you can throw a stone in their works. The pickets in front of us do not fire on each other, but up at the far, uh, <coughs> up at the Ninth Corps, they have not ceased firing since the lines were established. The men on both sides are patrolling around their works in plain sight, but when they see a large crowd in one spot, they fire a few shots of artillery without much of an effect, and our men do the same tit for tat. So basically, you know, you're within eyesight range of one another, and you're sort of tolerating the other guys being there. My last letter was wit written at Warrentown. I hardly had time to finish it. I was expecting we would have to march, and so proved. We started at 1 o'clock. This is 1 o'clock in the morning they begin this march and reach Rappanuck Station just at sundown, 13 miles. Just as we got on site, the railroad, the cars went by with an old frontier train on it, and we then made our minds up for our work. We pitched our tents, laid down wet. This way, it rained all afternoon. We had lain for about an hour when it was time out of fatigue. We marched up the track half a mile, unloaded the train, went back to camp at 3 o'clock, turned out again, and unloaded another train. So, you know, this is another one of those roles of the Army Corps of Engineers that goes ignored. And that is those guys who are involved in on, off, offloading the supplies and the ammunition that were coming down on the trains. And they were building railroads as well. The next day we throwed a bridge. That night we loaded one on wagons. And this is the part about wagons that I talked about earlier. And Company B went to Kelly's Ford with it and laid it. There were they were there four days, and our companion went down and relieved them. Our company went down and relieved them. We built a crib bridge. A crib bridge is another type of bridge. You basically build a square box with wood, and then you throw stones in it, and that becomes a pillar. And you build a series of these pillars across a river, and then you put boards you know, a framework of boards over the top of the pillars, and then you put decking over the framework, and that's how you create a bridge. If you know about the bridge up at Oars Island, Maine, between Oars Island and Bailey Island, Maine, if you know that bridge, it's called a crib bridge. That, that's an example of one. Okay? Now we're into August, and Sunday, while you were at church, I suppose, so he's sort of taking a little poke at his sister. Oh, you went to church. Well, that was nice. Here's what I did. We took up a bridge, loaded it on wagons, moved it down the river half a mile, and put it down again Sunday night. I was detailed for God on the bridge that makes five bridges. So that makes five bridges we've put down since we came here, plus two at Kelly's Landing, which is five miles from here. So they put down seven bridge, bridges in a, in a short period of time. These guys are working their butts off. 
Okay? Another letter to his, his sister. Now you're on to September. It is such a long time since I wrote last. You might expect some news. If anything occurs here, they have news in New York before we know anything about it. <laughs> Nothing has transpired since I wrote last of any account, except at the beginning of the fight at Keene Station. We were at work at the fort at the time, and we worked until noon when we were ordered to camp. And when we arrived there, we fell in with the guns and ammunition. So all of a sudden, they've fallen in with the guns and the ammunition. In other words, the commander has said, we don't have enough soldiers on the front. You, you guys grab a gun, you go into the front. Okay? Uh, and we're marched to, to the place behind the briar works to wait for the approach of the enemy. As they were expecting an attack at the time, our troops had been taken to the railroad, leaving a very weak line in front. The headquarter guard of the 5th New York Engineers and Regulars were called out, which made quite a force. We remained in the works until the next day, the enemy not making his appearance, we marched back to camp. So this is one of those cases where they could have been involved in the front lines and, and some very live ammunition flying around, but they, they managed to, uh, you know, skit, create enough of an appearance so the enemy didn't advance. There were only two companies in camp at present, A and B, are down at Weldon Road. Details of C and D go to work every day. They are laying railroad. So here's a case where you can see it documented. These are the guys laying the railroad. Here, now that connects to Kathy Port Road, Katie Port Road, and is going to extend down to General Warren on the left. Okay? Now, Wilcott letters, Will, Lyman Wilcott's letters were more social exchanges. He, he engaged in a good many uh, friendly little bobs, and he also wanted a lot of gossip from back home. Uh, he didn't offer a whole lot of information on uh, what was going on at the war front. So uh, I'll give you a few samples of what he writes. After we get this finished, we were going across the river just opposite. It's about a half a mile across to Mr. Bates is superintendent of the works, and Mr. Ferrier is foreman of the Masons. We have no one to draw. Uh, Mr. Bates, by the way, is from Cohasset. So this is another Bates. I forget his first, a, another Cohasset guy. I forget his first name. But he, he's a, in the Army Corps of Engineers. He's not usually with these four guys, but he was at this particular point. And so, since they know Mr. Bates, he says, we have no one to drive us, so we do not mean to kill ourselves with work. <laughs> I suppose Wally and Dode uh, have been at work in the woods. So these two guys are getting ready. These are the two brothers that are going to be drafted. They're getting uh, the wood in. So in other words, they're going to the wood lot and cutting all they can in January in order to get it in so that it's there for the family to burn for the, for the upcoming year. Uh, when you have a chance, send me a paper. We can't get anything here to read. When will you write with all the news? And then the writer, later he writes to his sister. A report came by mail this morning that Charlie Gross was dead, and I was sorry to hear about it. But I saw him an hour ago, <laughs> and he didn't look much like a dead man. Then I don't think it can be true. The Cohasset boys are all well. Cyrus Bates. Cyrus Bates is another Bates. It's not the, the Bates that's up in the higher supervision. Uh, Cyrus Bates has never been sick yet, nor any of the boys, and I believe he has written a number of times since the battle. I was paid about five months ago, and I think we'll be getting paid again next week. So this, this demonstrates to you the problem with getting paid. They're supposed to be paid every month. Sorry, boys, 
field, you know, hard, to, hard for us to get to the field. So they're getting paid every two months, five months, six months. Not an easy way to go. And, and just think of the family that's back home and actually needs that money, you know, for survival. And then we have this. The express man that took the box was Tracy, or one of his men. But I guess you will never get it. We are having good times now, and I like it first rate. You can send the box as often as you are a minute now, as I can get it without any trouble. There is nothing going on here. We have had rather cold weather the last three days in one good snowstorm. So this demonstrates the problem, sometimes even incoming mail or packages were stolen. And, and so I thought that was a good example of that. And then he writes to his brother, Elbridge, it seems all the fools ain't dead yet up in Cohasset. <laughs> <laughs> For by your letter, it seems that Johnny Pratt and Lewis Wilcott are married. Well, let them go it. When they get as old as I am, they will think differently. <laughs> <laughs> now, it it says Lois in the trans Lewis in the transcription. That should be Lois. Okay, uh, Louisa, Louisa. Excuse me. So that it, it's not Louise. It's Louisa, and so. She, that's their sister, and she's married John Pratt. Uh, and he says, when they get as old as I am, they'll think differently. And then he writes this to his sister. Don't let me, no, he's writing this to Elbridge. Remember that set of letters where Elbridge writes to Mary and says, don't let Lyman re-enlist? So then Mary, tells Lyman not to re-enlist. Now, this is Lyman's response back to Elbridge. Don't let Mary make a rebel of you. She tried me hard, but had to give up. I believe her doctrine is to give in beat and let Johnnies have it their own way. That's what she talks, but guess she don't mean it. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, we have to realize not everybody was fully in favor of the Civil War. And some people thought, fine, if the South wants to go its own way, let them, let them have it. Okay? And then he writes this to his sister. I received your letter on February 5th, last Tuesday. Protection, scolding, and all. I am very much obliged to you for sending it. <laughs> So she's giving him a bad time, and he's sort of needling her in return. Well, I thought this would be about as long as you could possibly endure. And so uh, we'll end here. I hope you've enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, it's a great set of letters that the uh, Cohasset Historical Society is really very fortunate. And, you know, it goes back to having establish themselves and being prominent in the community and being trusted as a resource that people say, hey, if I give something to the Cohasset Historical Society, they're going to treat it well and they're going to get it properly curated and they're going to get it properly interpreted and uh, it, it's a step forward. That's a lot different. You see, sometimes where the historical societies are, are looked upon as, as corrupt outfits, frankly. Uh, but this, the Cohasset Historical Society is, is very, very highly regarded. Okay? So, all right, folks, I hope you enjoyed yourself. And